الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنة إلى يوم الدين Our praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on his last prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. As was stated, the topic of this evening's presentation is love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The basis of this is a statement quoted by Anas ibn Malik in which he said that he heard Prophet Muhammad sallallahu say la yu'minu ahadukum hatta akuna ahabba ilayhi min malihi wa ahlihi wa nasi ajma'in none of you has truly believed until I become more beloved to him than his wealth his family, and all of mankind. <coughs> that particular narration is by an nasai and there is a similar narration in Bukhari and Muslim, as well as in an nasai in which he said, until I become more beloved to him than his father, his son, or his child, and all of mankind. حتى أكون أحب إليه من والده وولده والناس أجمعين. This statement of the Prophet وسلم, defines for us that our faith depends on our love of the Prophet وسلم. Loving the Prophet وسلم, is an essential part of faith. This is also reinforced by the fact that our declaration of faith is made up not only of one statement but of two statements. One, a statement that there is nothing worthy of worship but Allah. And the second, that Muhammad وسلم, is the messenger of Allah. We repeat this in our salah. And it is our means for entering into Islam. And it is reinforced in the Quran and in many other statements of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, himself. But though the mass of Muslims know this, they have heard that we must love the Prophet And everyone will swear that they do love the Prophet The question still remains, what does it mean to love the Prophet he said that he must be more beloved to us than our wealth. Than our wealth. So, the way we love our wealth, meaning that we will do anything to preserve it, to attain it, to get it, and this love is not an emotional love the same as we love our mother or our child. That is a love which is based on the relationship that we have with them, having been raised by them or having raised them. That relationship develops a particular kind of love. But wealth. The love of wealth is a different kind of love. It is a wealth, it is a love which has
has to do with what wealth represents. Because when a person loves money, it's not for money itself, but what the money represents, what one can do with that money. So one's love for it is a love which makes the individual want to preserve it at all costs. He will do anything for it. So that kind of love that we have for wealth, we are supposed to have an even greater level of love for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It means that if we have a choice between doing what constitutes love of the Prophet وسلم, and love of our wealth, then we will choose what constitutes love of the Prophet This is what it means. It must mean this. To love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam more than our wealth it means that if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has instructed us to do something and our bosses our environment our economical environment tells us that if you don't do this other thing you will not get your wealth, you will lose this wealth, you will lose your job or whatever. We are going to choose to follow the instructions of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, how many of us can say truly in our hearts that we have the love of the Prophet ﷺ? Just on the basis of that criterion, how many of us can truly say it? How many Muslims around this world can truly say that? I think we'll be hard pressed to find many. So, the reality is that we need to reflect again on the love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have to renew our faith regarding that love. And for us to make that love meaningful, we have to know why we need to love the Prophet ﷺ. Because the Prophet ﷺ doesn't need our love. Our love of him is not going to improve his status in the next life. Whether we love him or we don't love him, it is not going to change his status. What Allah has destined for him in paradise is destined, is his. Whether every Muslim loves him or every so-called Muslim hates him. In practice. Of course, no Muslim is going to say, I hate the Prophet Wasallam." in words, but in their lives, if they live lives which are co totally contradictory to the instructions of the Prophet wasallam, then they are in fact saying, I hate the Prophet wasallam. I hate him. Because as they say, actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. Actions express what is truly in our hearts. People can say anything. But in the end, how they act will tell you what they really think. That is why our five pillars of Islam, only one is theory. The declaration of faith. The other four are all practice. Okay, you say you believe, then establish the prayer. Fast Ramadan. Give your zakah. Make the hajj. This is proof of the declaration of 
So four fifths of Iman is action. One fifth is theory. That is the Islamic formula. And this is what we have to come back to. Why do we need to love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Since he doesn't need our love, and certainly Allah doesn't need our love, why do we need to love him? We need to love him because he is the key to paradise. We were created in paradise. We were created for paradise. And the only way that we will get back to paradise is by following his way. Love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the key to success in both this life and the next life. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has told us in the Quran لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةً حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا There is in the Messenger of Allah for you the best of examples. For those among you who have hope in reward from Allah and their reward from Allah and belief in the last day that Allah will reward them for what good they do in this life and they remember Allah much. He is the example for them. He is the best of examples for them. But for those who believe that they will be going to paradise simply because they were born in Muslim families, in Muslim countries, in Muslim communities, and they have Muslim names or Muslim sounding names. Those who believe that they're going to paradise simply because of that, then the Prophet ﷺ is not the best of examples for them. Because for such people, who will consider themselves Muslims, paradise is guaranteed. Like the Jews and the Christians, the Jews believe that they were the beloved of God, Allah's children. Similarly, the Christians. Christians will tell you, he is sure of paradise. He has accepted Jesus Christ in his life and that is his guarantee for paradise. No doubt. And the Jew, because he is a Jew, paradise is his. This world was created for him. Now Allah describes those who hold such beliefs in scornful terms. They have been deluded by Satan. He has told us that not so that we may scorn them, but that we may not fall into the same trap. Unfortunately, as Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu told us, you will follow the ways of the people before you. Step by step. Inch by inch. Until if they went into a lizard's hole, you will follow them in that. And this is what has happened to Muslims today. 
They are Muslims in name. So Prophet Muhammad Wasallam does not represent for them an example anymore. If they are invited to follow the way of the Prophet وسلم, they will say this is not what my people did this is not what my parents did this is not the way we do it in our country we are Hanafis or we are Shafi's they will give all kinds of answers when presented with what Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said or did and Allah said the same thing about the pagan Meccans. When the Prophet وسلم, invited them to the worship of one God, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ وَإِلَىٰ الرَّسُولِ Allah says, if you say to them, come to what Allah has revealed and to His Messenger. قَالُوا حَسْبُنَا مَا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهِ أَبَاءَنَا They will say, it's enough. What we found our foreparents doing is enough for us. We don't need it. We don't need this revelation. We don't need this messenger. What our parents did is enough. This was what took Abu Talib to hell. Abu Talib, the uncle of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who raised him, who protected him, who defended him, who knew he was a messenger of Allah. But on his deathbed, when Prophet Muhammad وسلم, invited him to accept Islam, to declare his acceptance of Islam, and his brothers were there telling him, are you going to give up the way of our foreparents? Are you going to embarrass us? Are you going to dishonor the tribe? Abu Talib chose to uphold the honor of the tribe. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said that for the good he did in this life, Allah gave him the least punishment in the hellfire. He will be in the hellfire forever, though his punishment will be less than anybody else. He will be in the hellfire up to his ankles. The hellfire will be up to his ankles. But it would be sufficient for his brains to boil forever. This is the future of those who when the sunnah, when the way of the Prophet وسلم, is brought to them, their response is, I am a Hanafi. That's not what my parents did. In the old country, we used to do it a different way. That is the future. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has warned us in so many verses in the Quran about what happens to those who go against the way of the Prophet. For example, in verse 115, وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعَ غَيْرَ السَّبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُسْلِهِ جَهَنَّمْ وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا Whoever contradicts the Prophet وسلم, after it has been made clear to him, guidance has been made clear, this way of the Prophet ﷺ has been made clear to him, and they follow a way other than the way of the true believers, that is the way other than the way of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. then that path will be his, and we will give him at the end of it, hell. He will burn in hell because of it. A terrible end. Can we get any warnings more, more severe than that? Chapter 24, verse 63. فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِي 
and to see bahum fitnatun aw yusibahum adhabun alim let those who contradict his command beware that a severe trial will befall them or a severe punishment this is allah speaking to us brothers and sisters this is allah warning us of what will befall us if we do not accept the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as our guide as the best of example and love him a love which causes us to do whatever he has instructed us to do when we love our wives our husbands our daughters our sons when they ask us to do something we do it if we don't do it their first response is you don't love me <coughs> why because that is a demonstration of love that when you are asked to do something you do it for them because you love them so when allah says in the quran wama atakum ar-rasul fa khudhu wama nahakum anhu fa antahu and whatever the messenger has given you take it whatever is forbidden you leave it then how can we possibly say that we love the messenger of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we disobey him we don't do what he tells us to do and we do what he tells us not to do this is false this is false love this is no love this is only words words are cheap there was an occasion reported by salama ibn al aqwa in which he said that a man ate in front of allah's messenger with his left hand and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to him eat with your right and the man said i can't and then he couldn't but he wouldn't his response was i can't prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said you will not be able for it is because he turned to the rest of the companions and before it's because of his pride that it prevented him and salama said the man's hand became paralyzed and he was unable to raise it to his mouth this is in sahih muslim this is not a fairy tale this is a real incident which took place in the time of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that a person refused the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam commanded him and he refused so by a miracle his hand became paralyzed i mean it is not to say that each and every person that we now tell stop eating with your right I mean with your left and eat with your right that their hands are going to become paralyzed no. but this is telling you something <coughs> that eating with your right hand is important eating with your right hand is important because prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam instructed us to do so it is important some people say nothing it's a little thing the big things the more important things is establishing the islamic state you now this guy will tell you this as he drinks with his left hand and he's smoking a cigarette in his right hand and you know, yes we have to establish this state and you say unless you can establish that islamic state inside yourself you will never be able to establish it outside yourself Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he gave us many instructions <laughs> it is true some are more important than others and Allah told us ittaqullaha ma istata'tum fear Allah as much as you can as much as you are able you try to do what he has instructed us to the degree that it is possible <laughs> 
What is beyond our ability? Allah is most merciful. But what we can do, we should do. This is the way that we can develop love of the Prophet <laughs> We have to take the various instructions that he gave us and try to put them back into our lives. <coughs> the little things, which are easy, we try to apply them. If we build a foundation of little things, then we will be able to do the big things. But if we are talking about doing the big things and we can't even do the little things, then we are fooling ourselves. It is a joke. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that Islam is built on revelation, not on speculation or on logic, but on revelation. And that revelation came in two forms. It came in the form of the Qur'an and it came in the form of the Sunnah. There are two sources of revelation that we follow, the Qur'an and the Sunnah. The Sunnah is revelation because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ He did not speak, Muhammad sallallahu did not speak of his own desires. What he conveyed to you was revelation which came to him. It was revelation, wahi. So Islam is based on revelation. The Quran and the Sunnah. These cannot be separated. There is a tendency today to give stress to the Quran and we ignore the Sunnah. The Qur'an is stressed from a ritualistic point of view. We make sure the Qur'an is put on a high place, the top shelf, above everything. No Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu never said this. He never instructed us to make sure the Qur'an is the highest thing in your house. But it has, Muslims have become so obsessed with it, putting the Qur'an up high, that it was related to me in Taiwan. A generation ago, when Mao Zedong went on the long march establishing communism in China, many of the Muslim Chinese fled. They fled China. Some went to Hong Kong and a number went to Taiwan. Those that were in the eastern sector. Those in the western sector, in Xinjiang, etc., they had no place to go. Now, among them a family went to Taiwan with the idea that the Quran should be in the highest place. And they started their businesses, they got established there in Taiwan, and Eventually they died. Now their children, the only thing of Islam that the children learned from their parents was the Quran had to be in the highest place. So the children, the next generation, were more modern. I mean, uh, the parents used to keep it, you know, wrapped in a uh, leather bag and on the top shelf. What the children did, parents never taught them salah. Children grew up in Buddhist schools, so they learned the Buddhist worship, etc. In their home, they built a shrine in which they put the Quran in a uh, sort of net and hung it from the ceiling. And they would go into this room and they would perform the Buddhist uh, rites of worship with the Quran hanging from the ceiling. A group of Pakistani Muslims who went there as traders, you know, came across these young people who 
said they were Muslims, accompanied them home to find this shrine, right? That was shocking. But it is something which tells us that if that is all that we can convey of Islam, our future generations are lost. Our future generations are lost. Muslims put the Quran on the top shelf and it gathers dust on it. They blow it off during Ramadan, they read it and put it back on the top shelf. This Quran has no effect on their lives. But it is the most important thing, the Quran. And the Sunnah, I mean if they've done that with the Quran, we can only imagine what they have done to the Sunnah. Yet Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu has warned us that there would come a time in the future, as he said, Yushiku an yaqu'ud al-rajul, an yaqu'ud al-rajul minkum ala arikati, yuhaddath bi hadithi fa yaqul, bayni wa baynakum kitabullah. فما وجدنا فيه حلالا استحللناه وما وجدنا فيه حراما حرمناه There would come a time in Sunan Abi Dawood, authentic hadith that a man would recline on his couch and somebody would say to him a hadith of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم and he would say I have, what is between me and you is this Qur'an. Whatever I find in it halal, is halal. I will establish it as halal. Whatever I find in it haram, I will say it's halal. The fact of the matter is, in another narration, Prophet Muhammad said, but what I made haram is what Allah made haram. Because Allah in the Quran said, Mayuti Rasul, Faqad Ata Allah. Whoever has obeyed the Messenger has obeyed Allah. And we know. For example, in Sahih Muslim, Anas ibn Malik reported that during the Battle of Khaybar, the Prophet was informed وسلم, that donkeys were being eaten. And he instructed Talha to announce to the people the prohibition of eating domesticated donkeys. He forbid. But it's not forbidden in the Quran. <coughs> Similarly, the Quran forbids the marrying of a woman and her daughter at the same time. Woman and her daughter. Right? Or a woman and then her daughter. It's forbidden or marrying two sisters at the same time. If you married one sister and she died and you married the other sister allowed. But at the same time, no. In the case of the mother and the daughter, it's slightly different. If you marry the mother, you can never marry the daughter. If you marry the daughter, you can never marry the mother. However, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had also said, because Allah goes on to say, وَأُحِلَّ لَكُمْ مَا وَرَاءَ ذَلِكُمْ And whatever is after that is allowed for you. So that means, technically speaking, that it's possible to marry a woman and her aunt. Because it's not included. But Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, do not marry a woman and her father's sister or her mother's sister. He is the one in Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari, who forbade the marrying of a woman and her aunt. So, he explained that if you do so, it will break family ties. <coughs> the principle of breaking family ties is there in marrying a mother and her daughter, as well as marrying two sisters. The jealousies and bad feelings that it would create can destroy families. So it is forbidden. The point is that Prophet Muhammad forbade things which were not forbidden in the Quran. 
So we cannot take the Quran by itself and ignore the Sunnah. Both have to be taken together. And to understand the Quran properly, we must rely also on the Sunnah. We should have knowledge of the Sunnah. It is not correct for us to pick up the English translation of the Quran and then start reading it and making tafsir for anybody. You know the kids, you read this verse, tell us what you think about this verse. Give us the tafsir. This is not permissible. Though it may be common practice today, people feel the Quran is for everybody, so why not? But the point is that if we are to do this, then we become like the Christians who everybody has the right to give their opinion and they have all the different sects representing their opinions. The Quran is for everybody, yes. You as an individual may read it and what you understand from it you try to practice. <coughs> but it is not for you if you don't have knowledge of the Quran and you don't have knowledge of the Sunnah now to stand up and make tafsir for everybody. No, no. I mean, it's not to say that, you know, the Qur'an is only in the hands of special people. No! Anybody who gets a good grounding in the Qur'an, studies the Qur'an, and studies the Sunnah, etc., can give the tafsir. It's not restricted to a special family, special group, priests, etc. No, no. People can attain that knowledge. But those who don't have it should not make pronouncements for people. It's okay to read for yourself and get your understanding. You know, until you get a better understanding, you go with what you have. But now to go and tell people that, you can misguide, mislead people. Because Allah said in the Quran, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ And we have revealed to you, Muhammad Wasallam, the reminder of the Quran, in order that you may explain to the people what was revealed for them. This is the point. <coughs> the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Wasallam, not to us. It was revealed for us, but not to us. And it was his responsibility to clarify its meanings for us. So a person who doesn't have knowledge of the Sunnah <coughs> will misguide in making tafsir of the Qur'an as he or she will misguide if they don't have proper knowledge of the Qur'an also. This is something that I've been explaining in the course that we're doing over in Masjid al-Salam in tafsir. We've been explaining these points in more detail. But very important for us that we should respect the Qur'an. Not respect it by sticking it up on the shelf and letting dust gather in it. Not respect it by turning it into a book of fortune telling. You know, people will do this with the Qur'an. You know, if they have a problem or something like this, they can flip it open, you put your finger on whatever letter your finger falls on, they have another book which tells you that you know, if you get a lamb or you get a meme, this means this or it means that. Yeah, people use the Qur'an like this. Or people want to name their children, you know, they flip open the Qur'an, you know, whichever, look back here. Oh, give their children this. So we have Muslims named Bismillah, you know. You know, I met, uh, you know, two sisters, they were named, one was named Nahal and the other one was named Namal. You know, Nahal means the bee and the other, Namal means the ant, you know. You know, we have all these kind of weird names. This is what the Quran is good for now. You, know, you want to get a name, just pop it open and, and first thing comes, you know. People with all kinds of names. We respect the Quran, not by when it falls on the ground, people pick, you have to kiss it. 
Qu'est-ce que tu peux dans ton tête, non? Tu as des gens. Pourquoi? Parce que si tu tombes sur le ground et que tu ne le fais pas, Allah's curse va être sur toi. Comme si tu brûles un mur, tu sais, 7 ans de bonne chance. This is for the non-believers, they have this uh, kind of difficulty. So where did this come from? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us if, you, if the Quran accidentally drops, that you have to kiss it. But this is respect of the Quran today. If you, sit in the, if you sit in the masjid, and you put the Quran in your lap, and read it, people come, Prophet, take the Quran from your lap. Why, why? Your private parts, your the Quran. So who said this? Where does this, where does this come from? I mean, when a person is reading the Quran and he rests it on his thighs, is he, is he thinking I'm putting the Quran in my private part? No. Or you have to make sujood, you know, because you read the uh, ayah of sajda. So you put the Quran down beside you, make sujood. Brother, you put the Quran on the ground! This is... Oh, where do Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say you cannot put the Quran on the ground? Does the Sahaba say you cannot put the Quran on the ground? No. So where does this come from? The people have now put onto the Quran these customs and beliefs. If a woman reads the Quran, she must cover her head. She must put on her hijab to read the Quran. Where did this come from? Did Rasulullah Sallallahu say this? Did the Sahaba do this? No. People have made up all of these different customs and practices and beliefs which to them represents respect for the Qur'an. But these same people do not follow the instructions which are in the Qur'an. Where is the respect? Where is the respect? We have to question ourselves. Brothers and sisters, <coughs> Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he brought the Qur'an to us and he explained its meanings. And Allah said that he was the best of examples. He demonstrated for us how the Qur'an should be applied. When Aisha radiallahu anha was asked about the manners of the Prophet Muhammad She said, the Qur'an. The manners which the Qur'an taught, Prophet Muhammad lived. He informed us that the essence of the message which he brought was one of good moral character. إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ I was only sent to complete for you the best of moral character traits. Morality. Albir حُسْنُ الْخُلُقِ Righteousness is good character. So, love of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam must be reflected in our imitation of his character, his way, his way which represents the character that a Muslim should have. A character which guides us in our dealings with each other when we have differences in the masjid. We're not dropping back and everybody is putting their hands up and punching each other and I mean this is all over the Muslim community in North America we hear it fights in the masjid we have ways and means to resolve our differences it is by the Quran and the Sunnah <coughs> and the true love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cannot be expressed <coughs> except by developing the character, the character of righteousness which he taught us. 